you are Stephen Cheryl, right? Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? You are indeed and, uh, pronouncing it correctly. Most people uh, mispronounce it Cheryl or something like that, but Cheryl is what it is. And you authored my favorite book of all time. Thank you. Minotaur <laughs> Takes a Cigarette Break. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's not only my favorite one, it's Alton Brown's too. How does that feel to be like people's favorite book? Uh, you know, that's a complicated story, Brian. It feels great. That book is 20 years old to me at this point. Uh, it's like things are still happening to it. It's it's about next month will be re-released in the UK as uh, the Canongate publisher company. Um, they're the ones that dealt with the UK and the international publications, and they're re-releasing it as part of their Canon series. Okay. And I'm about to get the copy in the mail today, uh, in the next couple of days. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, I mean, I'm very proud of that book. Absolutely. As you should be. And you just wrote a sequel too, didn't you recently? Or was that, is that also a little bit older? It, no, that, that one's within, that one's, uh, I think was published in 2016. So it's new. And, and, and I wouldn't even actually use the word sequel fully. It is the Minotaur. He's the same character. He's struggling with the same issues. Uh, it does chronologically occur after the other one but it's it's not necessarily a sequel so it, it's possible to read this the second one first and then go backwards and uh, but yeah I, I, and you know i had hoped that it would have the same kind of resonance as the minotaur takes a cigarette break it doesn't seem to be doing that people who read it like it um got a great review in the new york times but you know so do you think it affected the the story where you are in your life? Like you're 20 years later now, you're a little bit more mature. Do you think that affected the Minotaur's journey in the second book compared to the first one? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, I think that, I think that most, I think that almost every novel has uh, an autobiographical element if you're honest about it. And I just, I, I just mean, like from the creative process, like I feel very free to tap into anything in my history, my past, my life to use as material for my work. So, so I absolutely infuse the things that I do with the experiences that I've had and the, the knowledge or wisdom or ignorance that I'm you know, manifesting. Um, Which is interesting, though, because in the first book, the Minotaur had kind of a wisdom to him. He wasn't an ignorant character. He had kind of a, a piece that he knew the score basically. I mean, he was an old character, right? It wasn't a he wasn't a baby. Wrong right, word, but I mean, I guess I mean, I guess wisdom maybe, but also maybe a little bit of um, uh, you know the luck of the foolish. You know, I I, I in that first book and and even in the second book, but primarily in the first book because it's it was. I was doing the first time as my first novel, you know, I did not want him to have, I didn't want this character to have access to his full past. I gave him access to his history via these dream passages uh, for lots of reasons, you know, um, pragmatically, I'm not a historian or a, or a scholar of mythology and don't really care about that stuff. Um, so I didn't want to deal with all of that, but it was important for him as, as a character uh, so I kept his focus in that first book and even in the second book really, really tight uh, and, and kind of small viewfinder and any wisdom that that was expressed. Um, it, it was um, an innate thing rather than an, like an intellectual sage like thing. History or lore or whatnot. It, it was an incredibly interesting um, story. Uh, so you you have how many books do you have out right now is it four books or is it more than i have that? Five, five novels and a book of poems out and oh. most of them are out of print now but but i think you can find copies of most of those things and, and um yeah so five novels and a book of poems feel for you now looking back on 20 years ago you wrote this book and four other novels and a book of poems but that book was what made your your legacy right as of right now absolutely and it's the thing actually that the Minotaur takes a cigarette break, and its and its immediate splash and success launched me into my job and kind of gave me um, 
you know, street cred among yeah. all of the college. Like, I just, my, my reputation was solidified early on, which allowed me to be very free to do whatever else I wanted. So, I mean, I'm absolutely grateful for that book because it, it's still allowing me to do all the other things that I want to do. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in an actively not writing place right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I never write again, I'm very content as a writer. I have made my voice. You know, I, I have a footprint. Um, I will probably write again, but I, I'm yeah. doing other things. I think I was 30. I think I was 30 ish, 30, uh, maybe about 35. I think when I wrote it, maybe 35, 35 finished it. When did you start it? I mean, I can count backwards and tell you this. I was the, the, the Minotaur takes a cigarette break as a concept came to me as a poem. When I was at the university of Iowa at the writer's workshop, I was a, a poetry student. Ah, uh, you're one of those guys. You yeah, went to the so really I, good I school. Wrote that, I mean, I was very much on the fringe of the whole culture there. Um, I, I wrote that poem in 1993-ish, I believe. And it wasn't until, it, um, it was my daughter born, 1996, 1996 or 1997, I had the idea that I could turn that into a novel. And, and then I wrote it. It didn't, you know, it was a couple years in the writing, maybe a year. So just, I would say I wrote that book in 97, 98, something like that. And then it took me a long time to sell it because, uh, you know, the concept is uh, conceits a little much. And I got many, many, many rejections before it was actually taken. Do you think you would have uh, gone the route of traditional publishing now? Uh, you mean self-publishing? Self-publishing, uh, yeah. I, I don't. I'm really grateful that I didn't have to deal with all that. I'm sure that if I were eager to get my voice into the world uh, and nothing was biting in any other way, I don't, I have nothing, you know, I have respect for well done self-published work. I'm just not, but I don't even have to think about that. It's so difficult to even look at getting an agent nowadays without going, ah, why bother? Right. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm completely aware of the fact that I, like, I just, I'm completely outside that loop right now. And um, I just don't have to, it's something that I don't have to think about. And that makes me very happy. But you're not writing it at all right now either. So two years ago, you published the Minotaur. Minotaur takes his own sweet time. His own sweet time, which is a gorgeous name for a book that took 16 years to come out. Right. I mean, it did take its own sweet time to actually make it into the world. Yeah. I mean, it actually, I, I was, actively proactively against writing about the minotaur again after my first novel felt like it would be too gimmicky um i wasn't interested in exploring that character anymore and then and then he the character came back to me in a you know a really interesting way that sort of opened lots of other creative doors so i mean i have i have many many minotaur paintings i have some minotaur music happening i have uh, multimedia, like music art performance piece that's almost done in addition to other things. But I'm just I, like, once that Minotaur character came back to me, I went fully along the ride with him. Uh, why do you think that is? Uh, which part? Why do I think? Which the, part? The, 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 well, he came back to you and he's had such a resonance in your life. Where do you think that came from? I rejected the character outright because it didn't it felt like a forced act and you know I'm, I'm a big believer in um following uh organic uh genuine creative processes and thoughts and ideas so i'm not mm -hmm. going to follow anything that's um that i feel like i'm doing just to fulfill some obligation or because whatever i'm, I'm just not interested in doing that it's about how writing is um a very big personal exploration Yes. And and when you came up with this poem, the Minotaur, you know, takes did he take a cigarette break in uh in the poem yep, too? It was, it was exactly the same title, exactly the same premise. The setting was a little different because it was a little tiny poem, one page. Uh, yeah. So what is it about this character that, that kind of that strikes you? I mean, is it is it the mythology? Is it about this guy sitting in the center of the maze kind of waiting for his victims to show up? Or or is it about the the worship of the old Greek gods? I mean, what is it that kind of 
hit you? Or is it just being grotesque and working this job that's so hard and, yeah. and miserable, but being good at it? I mean, I think that's what Alton Brown loves about your book is that it's about a profession yes. that usually people look at as being beneath them. But Minotaur kind of elevates it a little bit. It's a hard job. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you multiple things about that. Uh, the first of which is, uh, I don't know if you would have seen this because I think it was on the UK, the first release of the UK version. But not only did uh, Alton Brown love the book, but Anthony Bourdain blurbed it. And so that, wow. blurb, that blurb is, on, is also on the new release. An Anthony Bourdain loved the book as well. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how much of, because it's such a long time ago, I don't know how much of a conscious choice this was although i suspect it was writing a novel is hard fucking work like it's it's just a long dark tunnel and that was my very first one i you know i didn't know if i could do it i didn't know what it was like i think it takes a lot of bravery to say okay there's a character in my story that is not human all the other characters are going to be human but this one character is not going to be yeah i have yeah, read i read it a while ago i mean I'm, i should have read it coming into this this interview yesterday and I'll admit, when I got you to say yes to interview, uh, to be on this interview, I didn't even know who I was talking to. Because I sent you the invitation so long ago that when you said, yes, I'll be on your podcast, I went, okay. And I looked up your name. I was like, holy shit, this is my favorite book ever written. I'm going to have an opportunity to talk to this guy. And it's like, I basically, I crapped myself right there and ran to my wife and said, guess what? And we've been nothing but in a tizzy sense. I mean, um, but... I am correct, right? He, he is like a, he is the only non-human character in this story. Uh, there are a couple that I allude to, but I did that on purpose because I, but I felt like that the world, like to make the world believable, completely convincing and human, he couldn't be the only one, but they're just slight nods to these people. And the same is true in the second book. But, but let me, let me finish the one thing though, you know, the restaurant that the Minotaur worked at, uh, was called, uh, what was it called? Grub's Rib. I spent many years working at a place called Slug's Rib. I mean, my first kind of creative outlet in my life was cooking. I wanted to be a chef. Uh, I was going to so ask, the Minotaur, yeah. The Minotaur has scars where I have some scars. Uh, and, and that was in part because, you know, creating a world building in, in, in a novel is, is complicated and hard. I knew the world of that restaurant so well that it didn't, that it was immediate access. The people in that story, most of the people in that story are, you know, um, uh, um, what's the word for mixtures? Um, amalgamations, like blends of multiple folks that I actually worked with and, and lots of situations in there. Like I just went fully into something that I knew and made my Minotaur character work. And then like thematically, this is the stuff that I learned to talk about long after the success of the book, but I believe it was present, which is what made that book successful. You know, I don't, I don't really care about mythology. It's not like, I don't read fantasy. I don't read, just don't read that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the humanity of that character, his potential humanness that I think people respond to. And I really believe that everyone you know, not everyone knows what it's like to hide in a hole and eat virgins and lad seven once a year. <sighs> I hope. Uh, oh, yeah, every, hopefully. Everybody knows what it's like to feel like a monster with horns and to feel like the freak in the room. And then I just kept exploring that stuff. And this guy, you know, this, this character didn't ask to be born. He didn't ask to, you know, he was kind of thrust into these circumstances and forced. Uh, so I just, I went to that. Like, I completely denied his monstrosity and his fury and his power there are a couple scenes in both books where uh i let the potential for his rage shine out but just a little bit because i want it to be more about perseverance and endurance and you know the more the humans thing that, the thing that the thing that stands out for me is when he makes the omelet for the kids the, the you <laughs> know the uh i that was uh he was mad at, he was always kind of disappointed with the humans in his trailer park. Yeah. Yeah, they could have yeah, done yeah. more. I mean, you have all this, you have this gift of being normal and you squander it and yeah. you don't take care of your children. And, and I find that interesting. I mean, the idea for me when I was reading it is, yeah, it's about a minotaur, but it's not a minotaur. 
he right. in himself, he thinks of himself as a minotaur, but everybody else treats him like he is just a dude who works right. in a restaurant. Yep. And I think so, that's the success of the book. I think that's. Yeah, I, I think so too. I, I think you transcend it. If you do write fantasy and you, or you read good fantasy, I think the thing that you latch on to is the characters have to be human. They have to feel and fight and need things like a typical human being does. If they don't, it's probably not going to be a successful, a successful yeah. story. Are you well, considered well, well, that? It just becomes like genre fiction, which is also yeah. great, but it's like can be. The purpose is entertainment, and I'm not interested in doing at it. that point, right? I mean, you can have genre fiction mysteries and things like that that people just pick up and leaf through for an hour or two when they're done with it. You have something like your book that lives with you. I mean, if somebody mentions the Minotaur, I'm going to think about you, and I'm going to think about this story. But if somebody mentions a dwarf, randomly, I'm going to think of hundreds of different characters or something yeah. along those lines. Yeah. I'm glad you liked um, that scene about cooking the omelet because that was that was a I was very pleased with that and it was absolutely to demonstrate his compassion, his compassion to, towards you know and, and his kind of disdain for the other humans, yeah, the ones who couldn't take care of themselves. I mean, it was a really beautiful moment. It's like it's so easy to take care of kids. You just have to make some eggs and put some hot fried cheese. I'm like, this is so beautiful. I mean, as a parent, I kind of recognize that. I mean, when my son wants something and he's being you know four years old, I stop and i think about it he just i really saw i honestly think about your book in these moments i'm like just make him a hot dog omelet some cheese it's real simple yeah. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't take much to take care to show compassion and care i mean but it does take it does take a lot to write a really good novel that's gonna kind of move through time though i mean this <laughs> this novel took what three or four years to produce what about your second novel how long did it take you to produce what is it visits from the drowned girl this is from the drowned. I mean, I write fairly quickly when I write, when I'm in a groove. So the 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 writing of a book from conception to to kind of finished product that's mostly a finished draft, I think most of them take two or three years. Um, and I was I was you know writing the success of Minotaur takes a cigarette break. So my ego was massive. I was also um, getting a divorce at the time. So you know my humility level was quite high as well. I had all those things kind of going for me, energizing me, and I, I, uh, I was actively. Uh, I had two goals for visits from the drown girl. Minotaur takes a cigarette break has very little plot, and that was conscious. I wanted not much to happen. I did not want. I wanted it to be about manipulation of time, um, and it was about this monstrous creature. I wanted my second book, even before I started it, to be plot driven and and be about a human becoming monstrous, you know, facing the same, in my mind, uh, Benny Poteet, I believe is his name, it's also an old book, uh, Benny Poteet, the main character of Visits from Drowned Girl, uh, faces the same kind of struggles that the Minotaur faces, but he makes worse decisions. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to take, I wanted to take readers on a, on a dark ride. I mean, really my books get progressively dark and hard from the first one all the way to uh, Joy PA and then The Minotaur Takes His Own Sweet Time is probably my lightest book. And even that is not so long. It, it's, it's interesting because The Minotaur has a plot for me because I wanted him to fall in love with the waitress, I think, yeah. didn't I? I wanted him to, at the end of the story, realize that you know he's beautiful in his own way. I mean, that for me, while I was reading the story, that's what I was wanting to happen. And I think it did happen because I was very satisfied with how things worked out. He didn't need the girl to basically let him know how he felt about himself. He felt good about himself anyway. I think my yeah. recollection is that. I, I think you're right. I think you're right. Like he, it was absolutely about love. You know, I had small plot devices in there, like going to get the mm -hmm. trailer and all this. The, you know, going to visit the the where he fed the kids the omelet. So that there was some there was some linear movement in, uh, but I wanted it to be secondary to the thematic stuff yeah it definitely comes off as very human which is which is really awesome was the visits from the drown girl was an actual human character though you put no uh, magical devices on top of him to transform him into something else he was always human from the beginning to end no nope, nope, it was about it was about humans although i think let me think about this uh i believe there's a scene in which i haven't thought about this in long time i believe there's a scene in which the main character benny poteet and one of his friends go to a flea market 
and buy a corn dog and say something about there's something really weird about that guy. And the illusion is that it's the Minotaur selling them corn dogs, but there's no, oh. no there's no direct reference. At oh, I see. Um, so what do you you do? You are actual um, MFA professor as well at. Man, I just moved away from all of my notes and trying That's to pull that back up again. I teach at the, I teach at the Altoona campus of Penn State, a small campus of Penn State, not too far from the main campus because I live in the main campus town, and I've been here for nineteen years. How how do you what do you think about creative writing now as a as a creative writing as a major like the the actual functioning as an education device? That's what I got my degree in, actually. Just to flesh that out, I got my degree in creative writing. So I mean, I went through the an English MFA? department. It's an no, MFA? just the yeah, bachelor's. Yeah, I mean, I think again, there's no there's no simple answers to this because the world that we're living in now. Uh, you can't pursue creative writing with this notion of, of getting a job. Yeah, it's not happening. <laughs> if, if you accept that, I think it's one of the best pursuits in the world. Like I think I, I, I teach beginning creative writing. We have a small campus. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only bachelors. We don't even have a creative writing major. We have an, an amazing faculty, really active publishing all over the place. Uh, but I like teaching beginning creative writing kids who don't really care who are just there for an arts credit because um they you know every part of their life seems to try to beat creativity and originality and you know risk taking in any imaginative way out of them and i give them a semester of space to just fuck around and play and have fun and every year i get kids who come to understand how important imagination is so you know, I'm I'm probably I'm probably three or four years away from retiring, and I'm very ready to do that. And retirement for me means working much harder in the ways that I want to work. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm not invested. Like I'm deeply tired of being an educator. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. What would you go into? Would you would it be music? I, I mean, I'm not. I I'm making things at many many levels. I'm just going to keep going until I have my stroke or my heart attack. You know, whatever, <laughs> whatever happens. Could be, um, it could be cancer too. I think that's another one of the big ones. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping for stroke or heart attack. You want to go um, fast, right? I, yeah. I'm actually debating. I'm debate that all the time. Do I want to go fast or do I want to have a nice slow death in bed someplace with my cognition intact so I can talk to my family and say goodbye to them? I mean, I just think the suddenness of a heart attack and, or stroke would be too much. Yeah. I don't know. Is that your preferable way to go though, huh? <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, in jest, I'm constantly walking around thinking about what my what my post-stroke job or life would be in this little town that I live in. Maybe I could be the guy who kind of shuffles around and has a reputation for, you know, the guy who used to write books and now he can't comb his hair. I'm now he can't comb his hair. <laughs> that's, so, that's, man, they would invite you on a lecture circuit. You could just, all you have to do is sit on a stage and... Every once in a while, I'm nod as somebody and, try, and try to comb my hair. And try to comb your hair. Watch Stephen Cheryl comb his hair and talk about the Minotaur. Right. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, I think I'm moving. I'm moving more actively into into musicy kinds of things right now. You say kind of things. What does that mean? You know, it, imagine banjos and synthesizers together, and strange video effects, and. Uh, I mean, I love all kinds of music. I'm, I'm a, my, I'm very Catholic in my music taste. Broad. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not virtuosic in anything, but I'm willing to kind of play and explore. Uh, so, so for instance, on this past Saturday night, I was performing in this thing called Space Station International, where it was, I was doing synthesizer drone business and. Uh, wearing a blue jumpsuit and a fez, and th there were there might have been a chord or two that I actually played, but mostly it was just noise. Uh, it was absurd, but fun. And you played in front of an audience. Yeah, I think we uh, we we expected ten people. I think we had sixty people. It was a great audience. So I'm I'm you know that's that's my the the one of the things that I'm actually working on. The thing that I'm. Um, 
I have too many things I want to say right now, so I'm getting stuck. <laughs> I'm working on a piece called Autobiography of the Minotaur. Oh, okay. And it, it's it really it's a it's a project in which I going fully into the autobiographical potential of my Minotaur character as, as the one that I have created and, and the person that I am now. It's a fiction. It is a fabrication. I, you know, it's, I am not the Minotaur. The Minotaur is not me, but I'm, I'm just opening the doors of both and letting the material flow. So this, this 45-minute-ish audiovisual performance piece I have a bunch of Minotaur film and footage that I'm making. I'm making, do um, uh, you know model railroad stuff at all? You know what, I don't, HO I just scale, know. You know what, generally what size HO scale stuff is? No. Little, little tiny figures. Do you do Facebook? I do. You should look see, at I actually Facebook. have your Facebook open right now. You should look at, just look at my photos and you'll see stuff. So I'm making these little Minotaur figures and then taking pictures of them that are some films out of them as well. So this autobiography of the Minotaur piece is going to be a performance of maybe 45 minutes. I'm imagining three performers. I've, you know, I've already got two people who are working with me. There will be film. There will be live and recorded music. Uh, and, and it's going to thematically condense all the novel stuff into a performance is this your art all of the pictures are renderings that you created yeah it depends on what you're looking at but probably yes i mean i'm I paint. Well, i'm looking at all the, min the minotaur yep pictures and this is your um sculpture Did you say sculpture no no i don't make the sculptures the sculpture actually i'm going to read in uh, in the uk i'm going to bath near bristol uh in two weeks read in front of that minotaur sculpture her oh name is, okay her name is beth carter i don't i don't do i don't do big three-dimensional i don't have that in me yet that's what i'll do when i retire after i have my stroke i'll become a sculptor <laughs> and, and you'll probably become uh, quite famous for it right because i mean it, um, creativity is like getting rid of that ego a little bit and like <laughs> kind of getting into the baser instincts of your personality maybe having a stroke will help you do that open the curtains a little bit exactly Beth Carter, how'd you hook up with her? Did she hook up with you? Gosh, she has some good work. I'm looking at her webpage right now. You should look at Beth Carter. You should look at Nicola Hicks. Last summer, I, we went to, my family and I went to the UK and to Europe. And while in the UK, I visited the sculpture studios of Beth Carter, Nicola Hicks, and uh, Eve Shepard, all women in the UK who make stunning, stunning Minotaur. Uh, with this idea that we might do a collaborative book of their photographs and my writing, that's down the road. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to them. Uh, all three of them had read my novel before I reached out to them. So there was a nice connection there. Um, how does it feel to be kind of a, the go-to fiction of the culinary world? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I never, I would never even consider myself. I don't know how, I don't know how. I mean, there are, there are two gods right now, in, in my opinion, in terms of, of cooking. It would be Anthony Bourdain. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. And there's Alton Brown, you know, who I, I sat at the altar for almost a decade and watched every single episode of his Good Eat show. And that, that's not even how I discovered you. I discovered you at the um, Barnes and Nobles on uh, 15th Street in Manhattan. You were a staff favorite. Oh, really? Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll buy this. A long time ago? Um, 2007. Huh, that's funny. So it's like seven years after you've already been published, you've been out there a long time. Books don't usually stick around that long. No, that... They don't end up on a favorite table <laughs> seven years after they're published. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the Minotaur takes a cigarette break consistently and regularly, props its, like, rears its head and surprises me, and someone will say something or point out something. When the book first... You know, a few years after the book was out, I don't know how long, um, I got an image emailed to me. Some friends of mine from, I think they were friends from Iowa, but they were they were on vacation in South America somewhere, and someone was reading the book on the beach. So they sent me the picture <laughs> of my book on the beach. So, I mean, 
you asked me how that like that stuff has been happening for this book for so long now and it, there's no there's definitely pride it's a little bit like it, it's it's a living creature that is not me anymore not you that's right yeah. i mean i like i said Stephen cheryl is not the person that i was talking to yeah. And so I found out who you were. I was talking to an author and I'm, I was looking forward to discussing process and how they, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then it turns out to be this freaking book, man, mm -hmm. this amazing book. And it's kind of like that discovering your work, I think for people, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, manager takes a cigarette break. All right, I'll pick this up and see what's going on. And it's unstoppable. You can't put it down. You just want to read it. it the right person. I mean, I think it, it's, and I knew this in the writing of it. And even with the manager takes his own sweet time, like it, um, if you're not willing to buy the premise, then the book is going to bore you and, and suck. And, and that happens enough too. So it's not going to be for everybody. Like it, it's, it's enough of an issue that uh, despite, you know, it was, it was like lauded in the New York times when it first came out, it was in the recommended sections of the times book review for like four weeks in a row. It went into eight, eight, uh, uh, foreign translations, but it never became a bestseller. Like it's it's too far outside the mainstream to make that kind of a connection. So it's got it's going to have this. I it seems like it's going to have this, you know, light long lifespan at the cult level, but it's a little too odd to to have to let me you know buy a fancy motorcycle and a fancy banjo and retire right. Well, that's the unfortunate thing, right? You're not Stephen King level successful with millions and millions and millions of dollars dripping out of your checking account. Exactly. Which, which might be a problem in its own way. Right? I mean, you're always on the news. Stephen King has got a new novel out today. Everybody go run and review it on Amazon and tell him how much he sucks. I mean, <laughs> I am looking at a picture on your Facebook page that I want a copy of and put in my bathroom. It is the it is the one with the old man in the fishing gators and the old lady on the toilet. I just think it's amazing, and it and it really strikes me. Is it the old man or the old minotaur? Because I have that same I have that same image as the minotaur. No, it's the old man. I didn't know. I I don't see the minotaur picture. Uh, it, it might not. I don't. It might be there. If not, I'll email it to you in a little bit. And this next question might seem ridiculous, but I I really want to know whether or not when you wrote this book, you were putting effort into kind of writing about the human experience in the way that you captured with a much smaller viewfinder the answer would be yes like i i uh so many things about writing a novel and then writing, uh, any kind of historical mythological character could easily get uh overwhelming so i actively proactively very consciously uh, kept the emotional focus of the book tight and tried to make all of the human minotaur interactions real and believable and organic and consistent so so yes but humanity at the scale of one or two people in a small community which in my mind which in my mind is what does like it gives you this little mm -hmm. viewfinder picture that represents a much bigger picture no oh, exactly because again looking at this picture that my favorite painting you've ever painted in the entire actually you have really some wonderful work here but this one especially is very very nice because it, it's an odd picture uh, the man on the woman on the toilet yeah but there's humanity yeah. here you you've taken a slice of something and i'm putting a story together behind it you know yeah. what I mean? What's going on here? Why are these people in this bathroom? Why is that man doing that? And the humanity is kind of so subtle that you want to make a story about this situation. It's funny. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I'll tell you something about the, the kind of painting process because. Um, what is this? Is this oil on canvas or is this? They're oil on board. They're all oh, oil. Okay. On, they're about 18 by, it's like 25 by 15, 18 inches wide. So they're not big. I have, at this point, I bet I have a hundred and. 20 some paintings in that aesthetic realm. Do you sell them? Do you go on, do you go, do you do shows or anything? I mean, I've had, I have shows. I just don't, I don't, I'm not interested in promoting myself in that way. Uh, I have, I've had shows. In fact, I've had one little Minotaur painting that should be coming back in the mail from a show. Uh, but, you know, I spend as much time with the characters in those paintings sometimes as I do with characters in a book, but I'm completely uninterested in 
than the actual narrative. I know narrative well, and I'm I'm have a you know I have the little bit of kinkster in me that I like to put weird situations together. But I never speculate about what the characters in the paintings are doing. There's so much narrative potential in all the paintings that I make, but I don't care about that. I, I know it's there and I want it there. I'm I'm it is a it is um that element of my creativity is counterbalancing slow, quiet, plodding, isolated quality of writing a book. Mm -hmm. When I can't listen to music, I can't talk to people, it's all sort of standing around looking up in space. When mm -hmm. I'm painting, it's you know, the lights are on, the music is playing, I can talk to people. It's about composition and color and line. Happy accidents, right? I mean, yep, you absolutely. are not necessarily drawing something you're drawing and then something emerges. I mean, I yep. find that absolutely the most beautiful thing about creating art is that I don't know what I'm doing until I'm done. Yep. And there's no, there's, no, there's no pressure because I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not claiming myself to be an artist. I'm not interested in what anybody thinks about them. I'm just doing what I do and having a good time. And, and the end result is sometimes I get some really good things. Sometimes I get other shit, but I don't care. I can't usually tell the difference between the really good ones and the bad. What's what's interesting though is that when you set out to write the Minotaur takes a cigarette break, you had no intention of capturing the human experience in such a great way. It was surprising, I think you said earlier. Yeah. And when you do art with the pen and paintbrush or whatnot, you're you're kind of achieving the same thing. Right. And I wonder if the art precedes the writing did you start drawing before you started writing and do you uh, think you use the same muscles i think that my creative process has lots of overlap and similarity whether it's making words or visual art or music now because i think my, my aesthetic is the same it just comes out in different ways i i have always been interested in visual art writing was the thing that i pursued first so that's the thing that developed and then came visual art. Uh, and, and again, I didn't start drawing any Minotaur things for a long, long time. So you're going to retire in three to four years, you think, and you're going to be done with teaching kids. You're done with creative writing as, a, as an outlet, it sounds like, too. And you're going to be concentrating on music. Uh, you know, I, I, I may have another book in me. I, the thing that I'm not even exploring, uh, all the other novels were written while teaching and that, you know, I've had a couple sabbaticals, but it just means sort of fractured brain time. And if oh, I do no. another novel, I, I'm, I don't want it to be, I have any other obligations. So, so I have one more sabbatical coming up before I retire and I'm, I might have a book in me by then. I think that's year after next. Uh, you said the miniature retires is in development, right? But that, that's not the one that you're talking about. Right. <laughs> Um, I, I, I don't even know. Like I, I'm very content right now to be in the space of making sound and images. You know, I'm, I'm taking part in a, uh, an arts residency in which it's just going to be about my, my music and art, uh, or words will come up. And so I'm, I'm leaning in that direction to see where that goes. I know my process well enough to know that when I'm not expecting it, the idea for a novel is probably going to smack me in the back of the head and make me fall down. But I, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't pursue it unless I had, you know, the open time. The music is so immediately gratifying, uh -huh. especially at low, low standards. Like I don't, I'm just having a good time. What do you like in music? What do you mean? How do you discover music that you like? I mean, I, and then, um... Back in the day, you'd go to the record store, you'd be flipping stacks, you'd find something that looked interesting, you'd buy it, you'd go home, you'd listen to it, throw it in your collection, you're good to go. Nowadays, yeah. record stores really don't exist, CD stores don't really exist, everything's electronic, right? Are you yeah. finding new music? Are you developing or enhancing your tastes, or are you relying on old standards? Well, I mean, my, I think my tastes have always been incredibly broad. I, I remember, I remember, you know, I grew up in the uh, rural North Carolina very kind of uh, uh, working, lower working class, um, heavy church influence, cotton mill town, you know, very oppressive mm. and closed. And, and I have, and I'm not a believer, far from believer as one can get. Uh, mm. But I love 
old gospel music. I mm. love old gospel music. Like it totally moves me. It moves me at the sonic level. Like I'm not interested in the words, and I participate in this stuff called Sacred Harp, which is this really intense um, church style music. Most of the participants today, it's a couple hundred years old. This style. Most people who do it today are just freaks and hipsters. <laughs> people are there for the sonic quality. It's the same. Like I also like, uh, like I like Lil Wayne. I like Kanye West. I don't care about what they're saying. I like the sonic experience. But, and I remember when I was. 16 years old because I was driving at a flea market finding a, a record, an LP, The Talking Drums of Africa, and just playing that thing until it was worn out. So I've always been totally drawn to all kinds of stuff. Um, and today, like Pandora and, and Spotify, those things are pretty fabulous. Like they're, they're, they'll recommend other things. And, I'm, and I've worked my way into this experimental music group, and they suggest people... And then I don't care what people say about Facebook. I learn so much new shit on Facebook because I join all these weird groups. Oh yeah, you, if you don't do, if you don't do groups on Facebook, you're not doing the right way. I mean, I, I am not a Facebook person, right? But I have like I'm in thousands of groups. I can't stop signing up for them. Well, that's what I am. Like I'm a total consumer. I never have conversations on. I, yeah. I never have any kind of political conversations. I'm not interested in politics on Facebook. I'm not interested in arguing with anybody on Facebook, uh, but I consume. I, and I put all of my pictures and stuff on because people find me through Facebook. So it's like, a, it's like a PR site for me that's fun. But it also, you know, somebody will share like this old Appalachian banjo player that I'd never heard of. And then I'll go find them and they'll lead to somebody else. Or some crazy, you know, um, California synthesizer woman that'll lead me somewhere else. I find it completely interesting that you called it the sonic experience because that's very similar to the way that I enjoy music as well. I hardly ever listen to the, the words. I always consider the vocals just another instrument playing along with the band. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And, and nowadays I'm, I'm kind of paying more attention, but I also think music isn't as good as it was. Have you had an opportunity to listen to um, the guy who just won a Pulitzer for his album? And I'm trying to pull it up. Childish Gambino? No, it's not. That was good. Oh, so this is good. America. Yeah. That was I listened to that so many times. No, I'm looking it up right now. I'm trying to pull it up on my my drive. So it's probably gonna take me a few minutes. Um, that's it. So I mean, there's nothing that you don't like in terms of music, old gospel standards. No, I mean, I don't. I don't like pop. I generally I don't, don't like pop. contemporary pop. Yeah. So candy. I can't stop listening to it when I actually get into it. Kendrick Lamar's damn. Kendrick Lamar. I, I have to Kendrick check. Lamar. Is his name? He just won the Pulitzer for his album. Damn! Did you say Lamar Kendrick Lamar? Yeah, L A M A R. I'll find him. I don't know. It's so good. It's so good. But you can't avoid not listening to the words because he is kind of talking about an experience that you know wins people Pulitzer awards. <laughs> I mean, is it is it similar to is it similar to This Is America? Yeah, there's a similar vibe to it. I would imagine that this America probably took a little bit of inspiration from him. I think uh, okay. Damn came out before. Um, you should check out. A, you should check out this older man named uh, uh, Woke Up. I woke up. You should watch that. He's an old African American outsider visual artist. First, he's making some noise now that's it's intense and weird. And Woke Up is Woke is like an old man version of America. So you don't think that age has anything to do with discovering new talents and, and becoming nope. successful? Nope. I mean, I think I just, I don't ever consider success as a word. I don't, I'm very lucky in that I have a tenured job and you know, at, at a big tenure university. So I've been very, I mean, I've put myself. You, you do kind of have what people call success. I do. I do. And, and, and great fortune and good luck. And, and, you know, there are people who kind of. I don't know. Talent, right? Look down at a lot of people who look down their nose at, at the you know this tenure professor, all this business. I mean, I, I I come out of poor working class and I'm a high school dropout, and I am where I am because I put myself in the crosshairs of good luck consistently, always. So, what about confidence? How does confidence play in your in your journey to where we um, are today? You know, it's uh, I think that confidence and uh, is like a some, <laughs> requires something of a callus, like. It's possible to be beaten down and never get back up. But I, like I remember, 
I'm not a sports fan either. Uh, I did live in Chicago at the time of, of Michael Jordan and, and the Bulls' success. And I You know, honestly, it. you're you're so close to the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think it's best that you're not a sports fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love Pittsburgh. I've never – I think I've been to one uh, ball baseball game. Anyway, so Michael Jordan has this great quote about, you know, uh, he's won all of these awards and made shots simply because he's lost all of these games and lost all these shots. Like you just, you just keep at it. Get mad, right? You have to get back up and try again. Cause you can't lose on, you can't stop on a, a losing streak basically. Right. So confidence for me is, is about that. It's about, it's about understanding that defeat is not f- defining or definitive. Uh, and eventually you just, you, you, like I don't, I don't care if people don't like my work. I mean, I have an ego. I'll get a little bruised, cloudy, but. I don't care at all what anybody thinks now. So tell me, tell me about Stephen Sherrill pre Minotaur takes a cigarette break. You're, you're not even writing the novel yet. Are you working in the restaurant cooking at that point with an, with an MFA or did you get the MFA after you got the published? No, I, I think I stopped. Uh, I got the MFA in, in 90, like I was writing poems. I wasn't writing much. I applied to the writer's workshop uh, as both. I applied to both the fiction and the poetry workshop. I didn't get into the fiction workshop. Um, so I was just writing poems. And at that point in my life, I wasn't doing anything musical at all except listening. And I wasn't making much in the way of visual art. So I started kind of easing into visual art in Iowa. Uh, but it's it just like find, finding confidence and finding the voice and um, uh, you know, getting married and 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 breaking away from all of the bonds of working class, Southern oppressive upbringing, that took a long time. <laughs> you know, took some time to break those ways of thinking and being. Uh, so I, I believe that all of my imagined energy was inside of me at that time, but it was going places like obsessing over fish tanks and obsessing over, uh, you know, bonsai trees and just looking for a creative outlet mm-hmm. i think all my cre- all of my energy was inside of me looking for a creative outlet uh and and, and just took a while for it to settle in but you had never written a novel prior to no i mean i think i had started but by started i mean you know like five pages and then quit or or just not i don't know it's been a long time i should go back and look at it i think i have, I think I have pulled a, a, a genius novel out of a page poem. So obviously you should look at your old stuff. You don't know what you have back there. Uh, that's, here's, but here's, here's the thing, Brian. I, would, I, I realized a while ago I would never do that. I, I used to feel great pressure over the unfinished projects. Mm-hmm. I think I should just go back to that. I should just go back to that. And I made a really conscious decision. Like there, There's no shortage of ideas in my head. Not, there's just not. There, there probably won't be until I have stroke. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to go backwards and, and find something. If something is there, I, I trust that it would come up again in new form wherever I'm at. So you think that a new novel would start with an old idea, but never an old idea will become a new or an old project. I think the absolute opposite. I have tons of work that, I think about that was a one time a short story or a drabble or something along the lines that I wonder what would happen if I added another character, added another section, and then things just start taking off from there. I mean, I, I think I think one of the most important things is for any creator is to find the the process that allows you to make the most work. Fixing mistakes. That usually is the way that I get work developed. It's like, oh damn, that's misspelled. And then all of a sudden I have like four more pages written. Yeah. What are your heroes in the literary world? Oh man, that, that's always a hard. That's always a very very. Um, you're like you're like one of those names now, right? When somebody sits down and writes the next Pulitzer Prize winning novel, they might actually stay. Stephen Sherrill wrote the Minotaur's Big <laughs> Cigarette Break, and that changed my life. It made me the writer I am today. So, I mean, who said who did that for you? I you know the. Also, I get sort of test anxiety when I get that question. Like, I, I think mm-hmm. about the stuff that I read when I was young that I still remember. So clearly it had an impact on me. You know, mm-hmm. for instance, 
um, there's an element of kind of um, perversity or gothic fun perversity in most of which I just that's where my brain goes. When I was in the ninth grade, uh, I read this book. It was co-written by Terry Southern and someone else called Candy, which was a parody. Uh, I mean, Terry Southern. Uh, well, you go, go find Terry Southern. Candy was a parody of a porn novel. And, and he was kind of sub hippie culture star, and I loved the absurdity of that book. Like it moved me deeply, deeply. In small part, or no small part, in large part, because I felt the danger of reading that in Mrs. Altman, Mrs. Altman's science class. Like I was reading it under the desk, thinking, "How can we, how can these people do this?" Um, so the the potential danger of words like resonated early, and then it, and then all of Vonnegut and all of Mark Twain. Yeah. I didn't discover Vonnegut until I was already in college. I had uh, Tom Robbins was my guy. That was my I was about to list it. I was about to make that statement uh, in my one of my first undergraduate creative writing classes. And this was I was ignorant, but I the teacher asked like something about like who are your favorite writers. And I think my sentence was, Tom Robbins is the best author who's ever written a novel. Uh, so, yes. And what, how did that work out? <laughs> well, um, I think my teacher wrote me a recommendation that helped. Oh, okay. So, we're, honesty works. He saw through my ignorance. <laughs> you know, That's like, awesome. I mean, yeah. she, he was my, my naughty reader. Yeah. Where I picked him up at. But I picked up one book and I read them all. I mean, that was just like. Yeah, yeah. Sissy Hankshaw. Sissy Hangshaw, another roadside attraction. Is like, went to that, and it's all just like it's all trash, right? I mean, it just drips out of your brain as soon as you finish reading it. You pick up another one, you, you read it. But I guess it does stain you a little bit because it it, it helps kind of give you an idea of what people are like. Yeah, but like generally now, I, I tend to read things that I mean, I'm mean, also in a non-reading state. I'm having a hard time reading, so uh, uh, you know, I go in and out of cycles like that. Also, I just I'm not reading very much listen to music but i tend to read people i tend to read people that i want to learn something from about the craft like some way of handling particular craft. craft what's your favorite book on craft uh that's a hard one too like john gardner's the art of fix is it art of fiction is that what's called the art of novelist from being a novelist john gardner's book was amazing john gardner's i believe it's called being a novelist, if you if you do a, an Amazon art of fiction, that's art it. of fiction, that's okay. it. I mean, he also has on moral fiction too. I, I I was less interested in that one. Um, and at this point, I I like I've it's been so long since I picked up any kind of craft book that those things annoy me. Um, but I recommend they're better when they're memoirs, right? I mean, I have Stephen yeah. King's on writing on my desk. Thing reads so well because he's talking about a challenge. He's talking about yeah. how. You know, the accident stopped his literary career and coming back from it was, you know, he's had to revisit his youth and how he wrote to begin with and how he actually made those muscles work. Right, 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 right. What do you think of the kids coming up through the creative writing programs? Do you think I'm going to have a problem in 20 years or are they all lazy and just not as good as they once were? No, I think, I think that's always the perspective of, of people getting older looking back. I mean, I think all kinds of, all kinds of good energy. And, and and things being made and who knows what form it's going to take you know technology's you had a future where the publishing industry is just not faring very well writers are not faring very well right. uh and answering the question of uh dude what do i do with all this interest in this craft going forward if nobody wants to buy or read i mean i think there's always there's always going to be readers and there's always going to be people who read actual books and and it's, there's just always going to be that we just have to it's finding, you know, putting the groups together. Uh, um, yeah. So you think that the writer is going to be doing most of the leg work, getting the the audience together? I, I don't know how it could be otherwise. You know, I, really, I have I was definitely the demise of the publishing industry in the in the traditional way. Like it when that book came out and the second book came out, like I was given money to do these book tours and you know travel all over the country and. It just doesn't happen anymore. Um, 
you know, you barely get, uh, you barely get help with any kind of PR at all. Uh, so who knows? It's all, a, it's all, I mean, I, I, I think, so my answer to a creator, my answer to a writer, a young about that question is, you know, you have to find a balance. You have to find a way to make writing the work and making the work the most important thing. And then whatever happens afterwards is something altogether different. Whatever your skill level and participating in that is, you know, okay. But you also might have to cook at a restaurant, you know, uh, and, and earn some money. So I just you cook in a restaurant, you become a different human. You understand yeah. what it's like to to suffer because <laughs> cooking in a restaurant. Right. I mean, I I would never suggest. I never suggest to my undergraduate students that they go directly into graduate school if they have an option to take a couple of years off and actually do some living. That's always my suggestion. I think that's what helped me. I joined the army right out of high school. You know, and then went to college. So I mean, I was already I'm an old man by the time I took my first grade writing class. So I didn't have a hard time coming up with stories. I had a hard time coming up with you know mechanics, grammar yeah. stuff was always Which my is issue. All learnable though. All that stuff is learnable. Like that's just a very that's that's. that's I agree. That you learn. I have you know some of my best consistently over the years. Some of my best students are are kids who had just returned from the army. Uh, uh, and for that reason, they have the perspective, they have focus, and they have a life experience. Your art is wonderful. Your your writing is wonderful. And, Thank you. And you're a wonderful guy for being on my show. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Brian. And really, you look me up again if you want. To.